Good morning, church family. Greetings from the Hom household, where we've been sheltering in place for the past six weeks. As you can see, we're well prepared to ride out this pandemic. It's business as usual via Zoom. Doing high school via Zoom. Taking college finals via Zoom. Holding work meetings via Zoom. Celebrating birthdays via Zoom. Woo! Happy birthday, Dad! Woo! Like everyone else in America, this experience has given us time to reflect on the most important things needed to make it through life's challenges. Faith. Family. Friends. And fast Wi-Fi. We hope you enjoy today's service. Be well, take care, God bless.
Thank you, Jenny and Sharon, for playing accompaniment for today's uh, worship singing. Let us now declare our faith in God through the reading of the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, I would like to make some announcements. Some of these announcements are the same every week, but we want to make sure that you are aware of what's going on. Our online worship services will continue to take place as we are doing right now during the month of May with a Japanese service at 9 a.m. and English service at 1030. Right after this worship service, there will be a Zoom hangout meeting from roughly 1130 so you can see one another. Also this afternoon at one o'clock, there will be a youth group meeting online. I hope that you can join in on that. Other online meetings are taking place throughout the week. If you are interested in finding out more about these meetings, please contact me at ichibehonda at gmail.com. We thank you for your continued prayers and financial support of the church's ministry. If you like to give an offering, you can get, write a check and mail it to the church's address. You can give online through an app called Tidely as well by clicking on the Give button on our church's website. As you can see on the screen, I'm showing you what that uh, uh, Tidely app looks like. And you can see that uh, right on the right side, there's a drop down screen or a drop down, uh, I guess, a window uh, that shows you the different accounts that you can give to. And so that's uh, one way or two ways that you can uh, continue to give. But we are truly thankful for your continued prayers and your financial support of the church's ministry. Uh, you have been very uh, kind and generous, and we are very, very uh, grateful. Uh, also, one more thing, um, there is a, a joint deacons meeting uh, this afternoon, and uh, I just ask for your prayers for them as they meet together and discuss and decide on matters regarding ministry, especially during this time, and also just prayerful consideration of um, how and when to open things up again. Of course, we will follow uh, governmental uh, regulations and guidelines, but uh, we do want uh, wisdom and guidance in these matters. So we greatly appreciate your prayers. At this time, um, it is the first Sunday of the month, so we want to um, celebrate uh, and, and uh, pray a prayer blessing upon those who have birthdays as well as anniversaries during this month of May. Uh, first of all, uh, which is today, uh, May 3rd, uh, it's Ray Holmes' birthday. And you might have noted that um, uh, in the uh, greeting video earlier uh, that it was mentioned. Uh, happy birthday. And so today is Ray Holmes' birthday. Uh, May 5th, it is uh, Jay and Sharon Okamoto's wedding anniversary. Uh, May 9th, Janice Newell's birthday. May 10th, Luke Trofgruben's birthday. May 11th. Jeff Love, May 13th, Kyo Uda, May 14th, Haley Hom, May 15th, Ho Okuda. May 16th is Burton and Kat's wedding anniversary. May 19th, Sharon Kanugi, May 20th, Jamie Goon. May 22nd is Martin and Janet, Janet Yahiro's wedding anniversary. May 23rd, is Kevin and Jamie Goon's wedding anniversary. I noticed that this is their 10th anniversary. Um, and then May 30th is Daniel Wu's um, birthday. Uh, it was brought to my attention that it might be uh, might be best not to um, mention 
the birthdays of those who are under 18 minors so uh, uh, for uh, safety's sake. So I did not mention uh, their names, um, but uh, as we pray, I, I just want to pray a general blessing upon these children. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, again every month that we can celebrate these birthdays and anniversaries. Um, and Father, we pray your uh, special blessings upon each of these people. And uh, we thank you uh, for Raymond, and for Janice, for Luke, for Jeff, for Keo, Haley, Cole, Sharon, Jamie, Daniel, as well as the children that are celebrating their birthdays uh, this month, that you will continue to be with them, that you will give them your encouragement, that they would know of your love and your peace and your joy, and that you will uh, continue to uh, um, help them to grow in their relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. We pray your blessings upon them. We also pray your blessings upon Jay and Sharon, Burton and Kat, Martin and Janet, and Kevin and Jamie, as they celebrate their wedding anniversaries this month, that you will continue to bless them in their marriages, and they would continue to grow in their love for each other and uh, in their love for you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for these uh, people, that we can celebrate these special uh, occasions with them. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, now, as I promised uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, we will have a children's message. And today's children's message will be given by Rita Bokaya. Good morning, San Diego Japanese Christian Church. It's nice to um, be able to share this children's message to you today. Um, since we are in spring season, I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to share the story of a monarch butterfly life cycle. Now, um, God's creation is awesome. And the story of the monarch butterfly, I think ties in really well with how God has created everything in its own time, and that we are transformed by God. We are created new in his image. So as most of us know that the monarch butterfly, when it lays an egg and the egg hatches, it, it doesn't um, come out as a butterfly. It in fact comes out as something as we know called a caterpillar. So the caterpillar as we know it um, does not look that beautiful, does it? It's kind of a worm and it stays close to the ground. And um, we know that according to the life cycle of a butterfly, that this critter called the caterpillar has to eat and eat and eat. And then it grows probably, I think what I read, 2,000 times larger than its original size. That is quite amazing. So it has to eat in order for it to have enough energy to do what is really important for it to do, and that is to transform into something very beautiful. So here we go, and here's a full-size caterpillar, a monarch caterpillar. And then once the caterpillar grows by eating so many leaves, it starts to hang itself upside down in a J shape, and it forms um, what we know is called um, a pupa. And then when the pupa, after several weeks, um, lightens up and it becomes translucent, then out comes a beautiful, about two weeks it says, a beautiful butterfly. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, if any man can be in Christ, he is all a new creation. The old is passed away, behold, the new is born. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So when we come to accept Jesus, our Savior, he takes the old self 
and we are reborn again into a new being and uh, we are transformed just like a butterfly because of our imperfect nature um, brings with it a miracle gift of transformation a metamorphosis jesus will forgive us wipe our sins from us and give us new life um, i'm about to show you a beautiful clip of the transformation of a monarch butterfly As you watch this, I'm going to read something um, based on this book about uh, how I mentioned about the interesting facts and um, related to how this really ties in with God's plan for us. So because the eyes of the caterpillar had changed from six eyes looking in many directions to two eyes with 6,000 lens, as a new Christian, we no longer have to look in so many places to find this happiness. We can now see with sharper eyesight and the things we should flee from, things that hurt us, and run to those things that will give us joy and please our Heavenly Father. Now, the caterpillar can only be seen see in black and white, but when it becomes a butterfly, it has the ability to see sharper and clear in beautiful, vivid colors. So wherever we go, what we do, we will find joy. Things we participated in and observed before our transformation may not bother us. In our hearts, yet in our hearts break us as Christians, we can see what we've never noticed before, such as seeing people do things that dishonor God or treat others cruelly. This may have been a life at one point, but now, we know it hurts God's heart, and we no longer want to be around those things. We have a better vision. The caterpillar has 16 legs and the only the ability to crawl, but when it becomes a butterfly, though it's reduced to have six legs, they gain four wings and the ability to fly. Our new lives as Christians, we no longer crawl slowly. We have less weight to down. Uh, have less to weigh us down. Hebrew says from 12 1, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin so that easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We are much quicker to move in the direction God wants us to go. This gives us courage and the ability to do so much more than we ever thought possible. Thank you, Rita, for that children's message. It's a blessing to uh, be able to have our children's messages uh, once again. Uh, I want to get into uh, the message for today, um, but before we do so, I'd like to uh, begin with prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we uh, come before you um, and we thank you that we're able to worship you. Um, and uh, we, uh, this is a new way of uh, worshiping for us. But we thank you that we are able to continue to do so. And we pray your blessings upon our time together uh, as we meet uh, as families, as individuals um, in our respective uh, homes. Um, but Father, that you would um, be at the center of all of this and that you would be glorified. And Lord, we thank you that uh, sometimes we might feel um, confined or uh, uh, chained in a sense, but we are reminded in scripture that your word is not chained and, and it goes forth. And so we ask that you uh, will speak to us uh, through your word, uh, give us your encouragement and draw us closer to you uh, so that we might be uh, used uh, to bring you glory. Uh, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last Sunday, I uh, talked about being Jesus's witnesses. And uh, given our circumstances at present, um, although we are currently witnessing something that is 
never been experienced before in history um, as we go through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, my point was that there is still nothing better and powerful than to be a witness of Jesus. And the wonderful thing is that God enables us to be witnesses of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. Thus today and on May 17th, uh, we will be looking at the cost and joy of being Jesus's witnesses. In between those two Sundays, that is next Sunday, we will celebrate Mother's Day with a special worship service. Before we get into today's portion of scripture, let me give you some context. The last few weeks, we looked together at Luke 24, the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We did this to focus on Jesus's resurrection. However, in keeping with our study of the Gospel of Luke, we are now going back several chapters to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to continue on from where we left off prior to the Lenten season. So although we saw Jesus's charge to his disciples to be his witnesses after his resurrection and just prior to his ascension, uh, we know from reading Jesus's ministry with his disciples that in reality, he was training and preparing them all along for this purpose. Today's portion of scripture deals with Jesus sending out 70 disciples to go to various places to be his witnesses. Uh, previous to this, uh, he had already sent out his apostles, his specially chosen 12 disciples and leaders to do the same. In fact, what Jesus instructs the 70 is very similar to what he instructed the 12 apostles to do as they went out to witness. So we're picking up at uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 1. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. This uh, verse begins by saying, now after this. So the question arises, after what? And just to jog our memory, uh, back in Luke chapter 9, the preceding chapter, a lot of things were going on uh, in Jesus's ministry as it uh, related also uh, in his uh, ministry together uh, with his disciples. Uh, back at the beginning of Luke chapter 9, we saw the sending out of the 12 apostles, which I just mentioned a little earlier. Uh, there was the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, there's the instructions on how to follow Jesus. There was the transfiguration of Jesus. And then uh, the last time we talked uh, from uh, chapter 9 of Luke was February 23rd, and we looked at the cost of following Jesus. Let me just pick up at the very end of that chapter of Luke uh, 9, 51. It says, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. So here we see that Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem. Uh, as it says, the days were approaching for his ascension. Of course, prior to the ascension, there would be the crucifixion and then his resurrection. At the very end of this uh, uh, chapter, which is the verse before uh, what we're looking at today, uh, chapter 9, 62, it says, But Jesus said to him, uh, the man who uh, was interested in, in, in following him, uh, or he asked to follow, and, and the guy made some kind of excuse, uh, Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so uh, Jesus lays out that uh, once you are committed, you need to go full bore and, uh, and be committed to the task uh, that is given to you. And so that's the context of where it states now after this, right? So it says, now after this, the Lord, Jesus, appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So here we see there were 70 more, 70 others. In other words, 70 more disciples other than the 12 were appointed by Jesus to be his witnesses or messengers. 
that these 70, unlike the 12 apostles, are not named. I like a commentary giving about this fact. The commentary wrote, Better to be one of the unnamed 70 who did their work and were very happy in it, and whose names are only known to God. Better, perhaps safer too. There was a Judas in the 12. We never read of one among the 70. The point is that it was not just the 12 that Jesus appointed, but there were many others. And here there's mentioned 70 more who were followers of Jesus, and Jesus was, was able to appoint and send out to be his witnesses. Uh, these 70 were sent out in pairs, it says, two by two, uh, like the 12 before them. It's kind of that have this image of like the animals on the ark. But I also think of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And it's wonderful uh, to have a, a companion in, in ministry, as we saw with the two on the road to Emmaus, as after their encounter with Jesus, they were able to declare, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scripture to us. I believe the necessity of the pair or the two is very important. In my own uh, just experience, as I have um, dealing with really operating with just my right hand at this time, as my uh, left uh, elbow um, uh, uh, recovers, is that it is a lot harder to do things with just one hand. And and I appreciate my uh, my left hand or uh, even more. But we look at the way that we are created. We have two ears, we have two eyes, um, we have one mouth, uh, maybe so that we don't talk too much, but, um, but even if we look at our nose, it's one nose, but we do have two uh, nose, you know, holes uh, in our nose. And uh, there is uh, something about uh, the importance of having two. And, uh, and Jesus sends out uh, these people by two. So there's a, a, a support, uh, there's accountability uh, in this work. Their mission was to prepare the people for Jesus' coming through that way from the region of Galilee to Judea and on to Jerusalem. I love Charles Spurgeon's commentary regarding this matter. He says, what a mercy it is when the preacher knows that his master is coming after him, when he can hear the sound of his master's feet behind him. What courage it gives him. He knows that though it is very little that he can do, he is the thin end of the wedge preparing the way for one who can do everything. And this should be our comfort as well in carrying out any kind of work for our Lord, that uh, although we go, uh, the Lord is right behind us or he's right with us in the ministry that we are called to do. Uh, verse 2, Jesus says, uh, was, and it says, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Uh, recently in the news, I read a letter from the president of Tyson Foods in the, I believe it was the New York Times. Um, and uh, it was an article or a letter that indicated uh, that uh, meat was going to waste because of processing plants being closed. Uh, and in other words, uh, because of no laborers, uh, no food processing, and thus uh, less food supply and, and waste. And I believe uh, the same can be said about the work of God. And that's what Jesus, I believe, is expressing here, uh, his concern that the opportunities to meet the human need and bring people into his kingdom may be wasted because of a shortage of laborers. Thus the exhortation is to pray for more laborers, that is to ask God who provides the harvest to also provide the laborers for the harvest. In so doing, we are praying for the successful ministry of Jesus' witnesses because the more who come to Christ means more potential laborers who can be Jesus' witnesses as well. And I believe this is something that is true for every generation. Uh, we can recall, some of you may recall that there's a story about uh, General Douglas MacArthur right after World War II, that he called out for missionaries to be sent to Japan. Uh, some accounts say 10,000, some accounts say 1,000, so um, I'm not sure which 
is, is correct, uh, but uh, there was a call uh, for uh, missionaries to, to go to Japan. And um, I don't believe they met the full amount of what they requested, but many did uh, heed the call and went to Japan. But such a call is still going out today, and by God's provision, it is being answered. So let us be fervent in our prayers for more laborers to go out into the harvest. Verse 3, Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no bunny, money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. These 70 who were sent out by Jesus were to pray first and then to go. We too should pray first. You may not be the immediate answer to the prayer for more laborers to be sent out into the harvest field. Or are you? I believe that everyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ is also called to be his witnesses. So yes, we are part of the answer to the prayer for more laborers. As such, we are told of the difficulty and dangers that await Jesus' witnesses, lambs in the midst of wolves. The status of Jesus' witnesses in the world, the harvest field, are vulnerable. But we are to remember that though we be lambs, young and weak sheep, we have a mighty shepherd leading us. Thus the 70 that were sent out, as well as, to, as, well as us today, can and are to focus on the mission at hand. The 70 were instructed to basically take nothing along with them except what they were wearing. They were not to be weighed down by carrying too much. They were also instructed not to greet people along the way from community to community. They were to remain focused. In a commentary, it was noted, in the East, greetings are so tedious so full of flattery, so certain to lead on to wayside gossip, that men who are out on a work of life and death must run the risk of seeming unso unsocial sometimes. Um, currently, we are doing something called social distancing. I was wondering if there's something called unsocial distancing. Um, but at times, um, maybe to carry on our, our task, uh, we need to uh, do exactly as what Jesus notes here, that we need to remain focused and we need to uh, just uh, keep going. And maybe that, maybe a, a quick hello is all we can do at some times and not uh, chit chat. But anyways, uh, this is what is uh, what was instructed by Jesus. Verse 5, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. I shared this uh, experience before, but we had the opportunity to be on the receiving side of, of guests. And um, it was several few years back, but we had a couple who came to our church and uh, they were we call them missionaries or evangelists um, going around and, and uh, doing the work of God. And they came to our church and um, approached me and asked uh, if they could stay up my house or there was a place that they could stay and so um i i prayed about it i felt that uh, this was something of from god and i mentioned it to unique and uh after church we brought them home and and uh, they stayed for about a couple months i believe um but um the amazing thing was that as uh, we uh, had a lot of peace uh, we we received peace in hosting uh, this couple. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, that was amazing. Um, and they were, they were so easy, but that's how I believe it should be. Um, uh, when, uh, we do invite people, uh, who are doing the work of God, that the peace of God would settle upon us. 
uh, because they are a people of peace. Uh, the 70, as Jesus' witnesses, were to be bearers of God's peace. In the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, Jesus' witnesses are ambassadors for Christ, messengers of reconciliation, proclaiming peace between sinful humanity with a holy and righteous God. And so why wouldn't they bring peace to whatever household they were invited into? The other thing is inns at that time were often houses of prostitution and thus unsuitable for godly messengers. And of course, they had no money to stay in such places. So they were to trust in God's provision through the kind hospitality and generosity of others. The ministry of healing was important as noted here because it showed that the kingdom of God has come with power. The 70 witnesses had a ministry of both service and proclamation. And uh, that mixture or that uh, of having both uh, the ministry of the word and deed uh, can be a powerful testimony today as well. Uh, we might not be able to do miracles, but still acts of compassion open up the door for God's word to be heard. Uh, we see that, for example, in like medical missions or medical missionaries who go out that uh, care for the physical well-being of, um, of people uh, often open up the door for them to hear the gospel message. Um, a good example of the openness or receptivity to God's message in a town or city is that of Nineveh's response to Jonah as God's messenger and how the people in mass um, turned to God, repented, uh, humbled themselves, and uh, they turned uh, to God. That's a great example, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, verse 10, But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city, which clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Rejection of God has consequences. A declaration of God's judgment was to be made in plain sight of the people, both in word and deed. Wiping the dust off that city, uh, the, of that city off of one's shoes showed that the representatives sent by God, as well as God himself, had no close ties with them. It was necessary that the inhabitants of that city know the price of rejecting Jesus and his kingdom. At the same time, their message and the power of God's kingdom was to be evident to those who rejected it. They had missed the opportunity to repent and receive God's mercy and grace. We were reminded here that the messengers are not responsible for the response of people. They are to be faithful to their mission and leave the response and results to God. The assurance is in the fact that by the witness of God's word, the kingdom of God has come near to their hearers. At the same time, before we move on from a place, can we truly declare to the people in that place, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Will our words and deeds in such a place be evident proof of such a statement? I get back to Jonah's example, and Jonah's example is fresh on my mind because on our Tuesday night online Bible studies, we have been going through the book of Jonah. And it's amazing when we look at his um, first his, uh, rejection or, or uh, desire not to go to Nineveh when God told him to do so. Um, but uh, as he does finally go uh, to Nineveh, his very minimalist proclamation, this is what he said to the people of Nineveh, according to Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. There is no mention here of who's going to overthrow them, why they're going to be overthrown. Uh, there's no mention of God in this. Yet, we see that the people of Nineveh believed in God, it says, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. In fact, even the animals were required to fast 
it says in, in, in Jonah. Hopefully the people we witness to about Jesus will respond in the same manner as those in Nineveh at the time of Jonah. But more importantly, or for our sakes, hopefully we will be more thorough in our witness than that of Jonah and with love and with compassion. Uh, verse 12, Jesus says, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Gorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You'll be brought down to Hades. The people who saw and heard Jesus the most during his earthly ministry and yet rejected him will be judged the most. The cities of Sodom and Tyre and Sidon were notoriously sinful. Jesus said that the cities that rejected his message were in more trouble before God than these because they saw a greater work of God than any of those sinful cities did. Yet they still rejected him. The more we hear God's truth and the more we see him move, the more we are accountable for. In that sense, in today's world, the cities of the U.S., a so-called Christian nation, will be judged the most. The cities in the Bible Belt will be judged even more severe. If we feel we fit into this category, then the rightful response is to humble ourselves before God, confess our sins, repent, and seek his forgiveness and cleansing. Jesus ends this uh, portion, or we'll end our portion with verse 16. It says, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. There are only two responses to Jesus. One either listens to his witnesses, and thus they listen to him, or they don't listen to, that is, reject his witnesses, and thus reject Jesus. Jesus makes the correlation between his witnesses and him with his relationship to God the Father who sent him. As Jesus' witnesses are sent out by Jesus and therefore are his ambassadors, that is representatives, Jesus was sent by God the Father and thus represented him. Think about the authority and responsibility that one is given by Jesus as his witnesses. The greatest concern for Jesus' witnesses should not be with success or rejection, but with properly representing Jesus as their master. So as we come to the end of today's message, let us remember to begin by praying for Jesus' witnesses, the ones currently laboring in the harvest field, as well as for future laborers. Let us go out into the harvest field not relying on our own resources or power, but trusting in God's protection, provision, and power in proclaiming God's love and showing God's compassion that points to the coming of, the, of God's kingdom. We are to be Jesus's witnesses. It is not going to be easy, and there is no guarantee of a life of comfort, but it is a lifelong calling of eternal consequences. So let us be faithful to the task of being Jesus's witnesses. I was reminded by, uh, by a friend, a brother, uh, Greg Newell, uh, of the uh, examples of confinement of the apostles, uh, particularly John, as the apostle John was confined to uh, a prison on the uh, island of Patmos. And I was thinking also uh, that uh, Peter was confined, uh, uh, P uh, Paul spent much time in, in prison as well. And they are good examples for us today of how we may continue to be witnesses for Jesus even when we feel confined. Uh, letter writing. Uh, of course, uh, John uh, wrote a Revelation while he was on the island of Patmos. Paul wrote most of his epistles while in prison. Um, but I have been blessed by the many cards I have received uh, from people uh, during this time. 
So thank you to those who are writing uh, letters or cards uh, to, to people uh, because that's a great way of ministry uh, and encouraging others. Uh, I have a brother who uh, 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 called me uh, from out of state uh, just to check up on me to see how I'm doing. Um, and uh, he mentioned that uh, he tries to call uh, at least one person uh, every, every, every night um, uh, uh, to uh, see, check up on them, to see how uh, they are doing. Uh, their ministry as a whole is changing because of our current situation. Uh, at GEMS, um, they are thinking about how to do uh, some uh, uh, virtually uh, missions uh, work, especially during this summertime. Uh, I actually had a Zoom meeting with Pastor John Kotagi, uh, who is in charge of uh, a strategy for uh, South America missions. Um, but uh, uh, we talked together and um, I'm praying about the possibility of online missions work uh, with the church in uh, South America. And so there are different opportunities that uh, we are to consider. But the point is that the witness, uh, our witness for Jesus or of Jesus must continue. And we need to uh, pray about it and, uh, uh, and be uh, focused on uh, what uh, Jesus has instructed us to do. So let us beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And it's your word. Um, I hide behind you. That, uh, uh, Lord, that you uh, would speak to us, that you would continue to speak to us through your word. And uh, indeed, uh, if I have spoken uh, uh, something that was unnecessary, that you would cover that. And if it was lacking, that you would add to that. But you would speak, Lord, to us. And Lord, that we would heed your word and that uh, we would live for you to your glory. Lord, we do beseech you. We do ask that you will send out more laborers, that you would use us as your laborers to go out into the harvest field so that more people would come to know you and find joy and hope and peace in you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for saving us. We love you because you first loved us. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's close our time of worship together with a song of response and then with closing prayer.
let us close our worship service with prayer. Our gracious Holy Father, we are grateful for, again, this time of worship. Uh, thank you for allowing us to uh, sing uh, praises to you and to uh, hear uh, your word. Uh, please continue to fill our uh, days with praise for you and help us to be in prayer and continue to uh, guide us, Lord, uh, in your word and by the leading of your Holy Spirit. And as uh, uh, we close this time, Lord, I pray the prayer of 2 Thessalonians 2, 16-17 upon us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray you have a blessed week in the Lord.